welcome to another edition of No Limit. We are live this time because we have a very special guest here in No Limit. We have with us no less than uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Senator Bongbong Marcos. Uh, sir, welcome to the program. Thank it's you. an honor to have you here. Thank you. And, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of those who, uh, who are watching, uh, watching us this afternoon. Well, it's been a long while since you visited some Buanda, sir, but uh, tell us, tell us uh, about your visit this time. The last time I was here was for the uh, hearings on the BBL, yes. if I'm not mistaken. And, um, but this time I came, I, uh, actually I came, uh, my role here this, uh, today is as an escort to my wife uh, as we attended the Araneta, uh, the Araneta reunion of uh, the Araneta's of Sambuanga. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I always like to come and uh, join her when, uh, because those are they, those uh, those seem to be uh, very happy and warm um, uh, reunions. So I came again this time. Well, that's a, uh, the Aranetas are a big family in Sumbuanga, actually. Yeah, they're fairly large. They're they number in the thousands. So uh, yes, it's <laughs> you could call that a big family. So that's you're running. Uh, you have announced uh, that you're running for the vice presidency. Uh, of course, this has elicited. Uh, Different reaction from a lot of people, uh, positive uh, from those who are very who believe that uh, you have done very well as a senator uh, and as a governor, and they believe that you are the right person for the vice presidency. But to your detractors, the prospect of you riding shotgun uh, for the president's position, uh, how does being a Marcus affect your candidacy at this point in time, sir? Uh, it is. It is only to my advantage. It's uh, mm -hmm. as far as I can. As far, it's always been, and not so much. Uh, not only in this particular. Not not in this particular campaign and election, but uh, uh, in all of my political endeavors, I have uh, been lucky enough to count amongst uh, old family friends some of the great uh, uh, leaders in different localities, and uh, and so that uh, that immediately opens doors to me that uh, that make. Uh, Make make the conduct make make the candidate candidacy a, a little I wouldn't say easy, but at least more accessible. Um, and so that is that that for me has been a, has been a big big plus. Uh, when you say that there are detractors, I don't think there is a politician or a candidate for that matter who does not have detractors. <laughs> so it is something that we we uh, that I expect. It. I think it's part of the uh, part of the process. Uh, it's just a question of. Uh, uh, facing up to the questions that they ask and try and answer them as best as I can. How would you react to statements coming from uh, Senator Osmania saying that uh, uh, voting for Bombo Marcos, uh, uh, we would be the laughing stock, the country would be the laughing stock uh, of the entire world if we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not surprising. Uh, Senator Osmania has been a, a long time, uh, you talk of detractors, you talk of uh, critics of my father. And I think I suppose that because of that it extends to me. So uh, again, uh, I take it as uh, you. There is no such thing as a 100% vote. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is always opposition. And uh, I will. I, I. So it's clear that uh, he has been. He always has been and continues to be in opposition, not only to my father, but now it turns out also to the entire family. No, uh, we know that you're, uh, you have decided to run independently in this coming yes. elections, but you have chosen Miriam Defensor Santiago as your uh, your president. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the qualities that you see uh, in uh, her? Well, the, the, I, I ran as independent because the Nationalista Party has three mm -hmm. vice presidential candidates, and the, the, the party chose this election not to choose an official vice presidential candidate. So um, I, I, I filed on the, as an independent. Uh, the tie-up with Miriam has been, has been Senator Miriam has been really a very natural evolution of, of, of our of us knowing each other and working together in the Senate. Uh, we had found that on a personal level we get along very well, and we, uh, and on a professional level we agree, and on a professional and intellectual level we seem to agree uh, and are like-minded in many when in our approaches to governance, for example our approaches to the issues that are at hand. And so it was a very natural alliance and it did not, we did not, there was no great need for uh, uh, an explanation of one's position on each, uh, on each issue because we have known each other. Quite by coincidence, uh, since I have, since I became senator, I sat 
I have been sitting next to Senator Miriam, just physically in, in, in the plenary hall. And so we have these long conversations, mostly always very entertaining, because Sen Senator Miriam is very entertaining, but also uh, very uh, uh, informative for me uh, to, to, to take, to take a, uh, a leaf out of her book, to take some lessons from her own experiences. And as I said, we found that we, we, we have much thinking that is in parallel. And so that, 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 uh, that's the basis, really, of that point. Well, there were very strong talks before that uh, it was going to be a Duterte Marcos stand and What happened to that one? Um, well, we, it, it had been discussed. Um, his people, well, I, I've been friends with the mayor for, for a very long time. And I would see, I, every time I go to Dabo, I would, uh, I would uh, go and see him just to say hello, just as a matter of uh, courtesy. And, um, so when the when the, the the issue of the campaign and the, the, the election started to, to to be talked about, the, the people were suggesting that because he's strong in the south and I have a I, I claim a bailiwick up north, so it would have been a good partnership. But it was not to be, uh, and in the end, uh, uh, he he chose otherwise, and so I chose otherwise. So, but you cannot uh, predict uh, exactly everything that. Well, it seems that uh, all those vying for the presidency uh, seem to be very popular and uh, highly qualified. But what are the qualities uh, that you are looking for in the next president for this country? Leadership, vision. Uh, that this, these are the things that we feel that are, are uh, that I feel are absolutely necessary. I think that we have lost our way in many ways simply because we have not been given by our leaders a clear vision, a clear direction. We have not been given a plan that we should all follow so that we achieve those uh, those objectives, uh, those stated objectives, and that's why we have, we have the, the government government has been so let, let us say just reactive. Something happens, the government reacts. There is no planning for the future. There is no planning in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term, and um, we, we, that's something that we definitely need. Uh, you must lead from the top. You cannot. Uh, just wait for things to happen. And I think that until we find that good leader, that strong leader who will show us a good vision with a good plan and who has, who, who has the charisma to motivate the entire country, to unify the entire country behind his plans, uh, that, will, that will be the, uh, the key, I think, to progress and uh, a better future for all Filipinos. Sure, uh, the present administration boasts of tremendous economic gains. However, many contradict that uh, this is not being felt by the masses, especially the poor. What are your thoughts on this, sir? I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I, we all hear the, the reports about how much, how many, how much money is coming into the country, the rate of growth, how high it is in comparison to other countries. And um, but I go out into the countryside, and I am out in the countryside, and I talk. Uh, local government officials, I speak to uh, ordinary citizens, and you're right, it does not, it is not felt. Uh, the, 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 the indicators have not moved. Poverty levels have not, been, has not improved. Uh, hunger levels have not improved. Literacy levels have not improved. Uh, so the, 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 the job prospects of, of, of new graduates, or even those who are just searching for them, has not improved. Uh, the situation with the OFWs, uh, in terms of protecting them, in terms of giving them better opportunity, even giving them a, a more more assistance than they needed, all of these things have really not been attended to. So, uh, what's all the money for? What's all the funding for? It, we, we, I'm also extremely surprised. The infrastructure development has fallen behind the rest of the, the rest of the world, and the rest of ASEAN. It's a, they use that as a benchmark. Uh, we have fallen behind very, very much because for some reason this government has decided not to spend on infrastructure. Um, and the, the, it, there, was a, there has been a very strange tendency for this government to be proud of having money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Having money in the bank means that the money is not being used to help people. And so I, I, I'm mystified by, by, by them saying, earnings, we have uh, so much. 
that up to the point that they said we have a, we have so much billions unspent uh, of uh, of program uh, program expenditures that indeed that we that we're not able to do. So there's an inefficiency in the government, and there's again lack of direction, uh, lack of leadership, lack of lack, lack of good direction, in, uh, so that the rest of the government knows exactly what the plan is and how to achieve it. No, sir. Uh, your father has initiated a lot of development programs in the country. One which is very uh, noticeable is the mass transport system, of which uh, the next administration has not been able to improve on. Uh, others uh, on, on the sector of agriculture, for example, we have been left behind right now. But if you become vice president, what, what measures can you undertake to improve on this? Well, I, again, the, the the problem with the with the mass transit system in, in uh, NCR um, is an entirely unnecessary problem. Uh, this the the whole system had been planned since the 80s, and there were supposed to be eight lines, but somehow after 86, uh, the the construction and the operation of those lines just wasn't talked about anymore. That is why we have the problem that we face. In terms of um, our agriculture, it is a, it is a uh, um, saddening experience to have had a country like the, the, the Philippines be a net exporter of rice and now be the biggest importer of rice in the entire world. That, that, that's, not, that's a very dubious, uh, uh, dubious uh, title to have. So what, the, what, does, what can one do? One can just improve governance. And in terms of agriculture, let's go back to the systems that we had before. More irrigation, uh, more help in terms of credit, more help in terms of market research, more infrastructure, business-driven infrastructure. Uh, all of these, uh, all of these support uh, that uh, we can, we know how to do it. You, in in agri especially, it's very frustrating. Because you talk to to the agronomists and agriculturists in Thailand, you talk to them in Vietnam, and they're doing great. They have uh, the, the agricultural sector is, is booming, and you find out that they all studied in UPLB, uh, and so we are the ones teaching them how to do what they are doing. Uh, and why can we not do it for ourselves? And uh, that that is because there is no cohesive agricultural policy. We go back once again to this lack of leadership, lack of direction, lack of planning. Uh, that's uh, that the, the kind of. Uh, uh, admin, the kind of administration that is expected by the people. So, uh, we, we, there are very many that we have some of the answers to some of the greatest question, uh, challenges and problems that our, our people face. But we cannot get government to work properly. And again, it boils down to leadership. Uh, part of that is uh, not only in the individual choices uh, for that leadership, but uh, is also part of our electoral system. Anyway, it's uh, <laughs> Miguel Zumbaga, you're listening right now to uh, Senator Bombo Marcos, and we're coming in live this time. Uh, we are being watched uh, in uh, uh, Basilan, uh, even in Sibugay, and even in Tawi Tawi at this point in time. And we're very glad to have him here. Uh, that being mentioned, we just recently had the APEC conference here yes. in the Philippines, and one of the things that uh, was identified uh, as a problem that needs to be addressed is strengthening uh, small and medium scale businesses in, uh, in the entire world right now. We are lagging behind there. We're very far behind. We're very far behind. How do you think we can improve on that? Again, it is it, it, the, it has to be a partnership between government and the private sector. The government must recognize that to build a strong middle class, that it, we must we must support and strengthen small to medium sized enterprises. How do we start that? We need to start that by uh, having better and easier credit for small. Mm -hmm. Now we have a lot of micro we have a lot of microfinancing, but maybe in the medium level is what is needed. We need support from the government in terms of training, skills training of our people. We must identify the kind of skills that will be needed to support these small and medium term medium uh, size uh, enterprise, the SMEs. We need to find out what they need and provide it from government. We need to provide also the, 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 the manpower. Uh, you know, the, in, in employment, 90% of, 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 of all employment is in the private sector. 10% is in government. But government still has a very important role to play. 
And then there's again, I mentioned it earlier, business-driven infrastructure. Not political-driven infrastructure. <laughs> what we have is now is political-driven infrastructure. We only provide infrastructure to those who are our political uh, political allies, mm -hmm. or to, who belong to the same party as us. Uh, the merit of what the projects that are being brought is, not, is secondary to whether or not you are uh, aliado, you are with us. Uh, we should stop that. And we should go back to say, where does business, where do these SMEs need to have a role? Where do they need to have a power plant? Where do they need to have a, 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 a facility, a port, a whatever it is? And government should provide that in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of public investment. We haven't done any of that to support uh, small and medium uh, SMEs. Because simply, the, this government does not seem to recognize the importance of having a robust middle class. And that middle class will only, be, will only exist if the SMEs are, are active in the economy and, and constitute the largest part of the economy. Once we have that, we will have a much stabler, more stable uh, economic structure, and for that matter, political structure. Next week would be the deadline, or as Congress says, it would be the deadline for the passing of the BDF. I, I don't know if they're going to have a quorum or to vote on it, <laughs> but uh, uh, you have spoken, uh, you were very outspoken about the BBL, in fact, uh, you have conducted, as you said, you conducted several hearings about this, That's right. and there are several things that, that was revealed through your uh, uh, hearings, public hearings. What do you, what do you think uh, will happen now if we don't pass this BBL this time, sir? Well, let me, let me again be very clear, there is a subtle uh, difference. Uh, BPL, as for all intents and purposes, is finished. We will not pass it. It will not pass in the House. It mm -hmm. will not pass in the Senate. And because of that, we have now uh, replaced it with a substitute bill. And in both the House and in the Senate, it is it, we, the title, the short title is the Basic Law on the Banks of Autonomous Region. That is what we are deliberating now. Uh, uh, presently in the House. They're, they are in the uh, phase of turno in control, mm -hmm. and uh, they're in the middle of that now. But as you, as you mentioned, uh, they have <laughs> more <laughs> quorum problems. Yeah. Because uh, I think it was uh, uh, Congressman Obrigat who was uh, standing and giving his turno in control, and, uh, mm -hmm. and they had the quorum call in the middle. <laughs> so not, 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 not the game. Uh, it had to be stopped. Uh, in the, in the Senate, we are continuing to deliberate it. I am, we are presently in the period of interpolation. Um, uh, Senator Enrile is interpolating me on the questions that he wanted to ask on the substitute bill. Now, uh, I, I, I wanted to clarify that because I would like for our substitute bill to be passed because I believe it is a good bill. And it, I believe we, we, have, we have done everything we possibly can, number one, to make sure that it is legal, number two, to make sure that it actually, in fact, brings peace. And we have done this by engaging all the sectors that are part of the problem, that are involved in the, uh, in the problem. Uh, and by that, I mean the sultanates, I mean the different tribes, I mean the local government, business community, um, even the Christian, the Lumads, all of them have been, have, we have tried to engage them in the process. We need their support. We need their understanding of what we are trying to do. We need their support if we are going to succeed. But I believe that we have given them that opportunity when the, in the structure that we have designed for the Banks of Autonomous Region. Now, if that should pass, I think that it will be a very good first step. So we are still pushing very hard. But because of the delay um, of the palace giving to Congress the original draft, we are now really coming up to the, to the deadline. And the deadline is partially the session days, but the real deadline here is the, is the election. 99% uh, uh, of congressmen are candidates. If not for re-election, they're becoming governors, they're becoming mayors, uh, whatever. And so they are very busy campaigning. So I don't know what will happen tomorrow <laughs> to see if there's quorum tomorrow. But uh, uh, for our part in the in the Senate, we will not stop until we will not stop until we run out of time or we pass it. No, the question here, sir, is the question of acceptability by those uh, in the negotiating table. 
Uh, quite recently, we understand that the MILF came up with a statement that they will no longer go back to the negotiating table if the BBL, uh, the BBL is not passed according to how they want it. So how, how would you react to that, sir? Well, I think that it's positioning on their part uh, mm -hmm. because they felt that they got a great many concessions uh, from government and that have now been downgraded, shall mm -hmm. we say. Um, but it, 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 I'm sure they understand that it was a necessary thing that we had to do uh, because to create their own military, to create their own civil service, to create their own common, create their own core, was simply un, uh, it, uh, unconstitutional. And uh, no, that, 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 I, that is why I wonder why, why, um, uh, why our peace panel agreed to it. They, 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 I'm sure they had, they had lawyers in their staff that would tell them that uh, this is very clearly uh, unconstitutional. So uh, I understand their frustration. They, 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 had, they felt they had in their hands a very good, uh, but they have many, many concessions from the government. Those have been reduced. And, but again, I still think that they understand, all parties involved understand that we cannot stop. We cannot stop the peace process. We must continue the peace process. If whatever happens to the BBL, whatever happens to the BFR, we must continue the peace process. The fighting in Mindanao must end. We must find a true lasting peace. It is not a local problem. It is not a local issue. It is a national issue. And uh, the, the, the entire country is affected by what happens. Uh, and we, we have also these very disturbing developments of the uh, ISIS in mm -hmm. the Middle East. And we, I'm sure they will attempt, because there is a sizable uh, Muslim population in the Philippines, they will attempt to come into the Philippines. If we are not, if we are not in, in partnership with our Muslim brothers, if we, the Philippine government, the Philippine ma mainstream, the ordinary Filipino citizen, are not in partnership with our Muslim brothers, it will make it much easier for ISIS to come in and, do, and bring terror that they have, they have wrought all over the Middle East to the Philippines. If, however, we are able to put together a structure that wherein uh, Muslim Filipinos feel they have equal opportunities as every other Filipino, that they are treated uh, in the same way as every other Filipino, that there is, a, um, uh, there is hope uh, for the future without going to war, without, take, without fighting. If we can do that, then it will make it much more difficult for outsiders to come in. So that is, our, that is the only real guarantee that we have to be able to hold off or at least uh, mitigate the attempt of ISIS to come in and, and sow terror in Philippines. Your father had big dreams for this country when he was president. What are your visions for the Philippines for the next 20 years? Well, I, I've all day, but we, what the, well, first step, uh, uh, the first steps we have to take, I believe, are not necessarily structural, but in terms of the attitude, in the, the way we conduct our politics the way we conduct governance. Number one, I think we have to return to the demand of government for excellence. Enough of mediocrity. There are too many mediocre people in government. We must search for excellence. We cannot expect a good result if the people who are, who are in the positions that are supposed to provide that good result are incompetent. And uh, I, I, it is, it's, it's saddening to see that so many of our government, appointed government officials especially, have been shown to be completely ignorant of what their jobs really are and basically incompetent, number one. Uh, secondly, we have to change the attitude that of divide and conquer, all in the name of politics, because that is what is happening now. What is happening now is some of, the polit some of our political leadership, instead of uniting the country, is dividing it and all in the name of politics and dividing it and you're on one party, I'm in one party, we're not together. The political infrastructure that I talked about earlier, that kind of thing, we have to end that. Uh, and we have to bring the country together. We cannot do this, the government cannot do it by itself, the people cannot do it by themselves. It has to be a partnership between all sectors of society. And until we achieve that, we cannot implement the the measures that we need to implement for better governance, for better service, for progress, for a betterment of the life 
of our people. That is, I think, those are the things, the basic building blocks. We have to remember the concept that I'm sure you're very familiar with mm -hmm. of nation building. Do you remember years and years ago, all we would hear about is nation building. In the last 10, 15, 20 years, I've not heard that phrase, nation building, anymore. It's what will happen in the next election. Who is going to win the presidency? Who is going to be disqualified? Who is going to go to court? Who is going to go to jail? All of these things, it's all politics. And we have forgotten that the main job of high officials is to build a nation, a strong, vibrant, sensitive, compassionate nation. And I think we have to get back to that, to get back to that principle. Uh, if we are to go forward. Let's see. No, uh, one last question, sir. Uh, tomorrow will be the anniversary of the Mama Satana yes. massacre. Uh, family members, in fact, wives are still crying out for yes. justice. Right. Uh, your words on this, sir. Um, uh, uh, do, uh, do you think that it is right that we open up again the investigation? I think so. I think, well, I, I, uh, on, on several levels. Uh, on on the, the most uh, uh, on, on the procedural level, if you want to call it that, uh, it, it's, the Senator Enrile is well within his rights to say that I was not given an opportunity to ask questions. And he tells us that uh, during the time of his detention, he, he read the transcript, he read the reports, and though, well, upon his reading, he, uh, he, many, many questions came to mind that he would have liked to ask. So, He's just asking for an opportunity as a senator to ask questions, and that's a perfectly uh, valid request. And that's why the, the House of the Senate agreed. Um, and furthermore, in, for, and he, he feels that there are other elements to the story uh, of this massacre of, in Mama Sapano that have not been fully examined. And uh, he does not tell us exactly what those are, but I'm sure we'll hear about it. Uh, uh, when the hearings begin, uh, begin again. Um, for my part, I think that uh, I would like very much to know from the MBI uh, what is the status of the investigation into this into this massacre. I would like to know from the DOJ and Secretary De Lima specifically what exactly is happening in terms of their putting together cases against uh, um, against uh, those who murdered our our policemen. I remember very clearly that when we brought home their bodies, uh, and I, I, I met them in Villamore, I had a chance to speak to some of the families of those who had been murdered. And they never asked for money. They never asked for benefits. They never asked for anything except justice. Uh, I cannot forget that, uh, that, that uh, they, as I spoke to them, they, they, as I said, they never mentioned uh, material material benefits. Uh, the, all they said, sir, we never come to forget. Big yanning yun ang katarungan, ang aming ama, ang aking asawa, ang aking anak. And I am ashamed to say that this has been tomorrow to celebrate the year um, uh, anniversary or commemoration of that massacre, and we still have not given the families of the suffered before the justice that they deserve. Uh, it is a wonder to me that we have we have evidence, we have direct we have direct uh, evidence, we have video, we have confessions, we have eyewitnesses, and up to now. And I remember about six months ago when the first investigation by the NBI was given to the DOJ, Secretary De Lima said we are going to charge up to 90 people, and I believe that she even said something like murder. What will you charge him with? And she said murder, murder, all the way. What happened to that? Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I want to know, and that's what I will be asking uh, when the hearing comes. Sure, if you don't mind, because uh, we have been getting some uh, telephone, uh, telephone uh, questions. Uh, there's a question over here. What differentiates you from other vice presidential candidates, and why Filipino voters should vote for Bongbong Marcos for the vice presidency? Well, I believe that uh, that I have. I have experience in all parts of government. I have come, I started in local government as a vice governor. I became a governor, I've been in legislature, back as governor again, and now senator, back in the legislature. The only, the only area I've not been has been in the judiciary. But 
I believe that the, my experience in local government has given me a very good understanding of how government could, should, and does work at the, at the most grassroots level. And I think that is something that I have. Um, the problems that our, pro that our people face now are, as they say, dikitsa uh, bituta. They're about, they're about survival. And I think that's, that makes the economy. And my training in that, I think it also gives me the advantage. Uh, because uh, uh, and uh, we writing more laws, I don't think is going is, is what is needed now. What is needed now is to implement the laws that we do have to, uh, to come up with good programs to help uh, the everyday life of each human being. One more question coming from a televiewer. Uh, you are faring very well in the survey. People are saying you are the strongest candidate at this time and a sure winner. What will make you a good vice president and not just a spare tire? Ah, well, the, what, what, uh, the, number one, there's still a, the, the, the main function that the Constitution gives to a uh, vice president is to be ready to mm. take the presidential position should the president be not, not be able to continue. Again, I believe my experience in all the different departments of government, in both at a very high level and at the lo at local level, has uh, made me ready for that. But uh, because we, s we vote for the president and the vice president separately, uh, it, gives, it, it gives the vice president very much, uh, how do you say, uh, flexibility in what they choose to do. So it really is up to the new vice president uh, that is newly elected to decide what to make of that office. And I, 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 did, I am not running a campaign for the vice presidency so as to just wait uh, for something terrible to happen to my president. Quite the contrary. Uh, I have been asked, what's the first thing you will do uh, if you are elected vice president? I said, the first thing I will do is I will report to my president. And I will say, I'm here. I'm ready to work with you. I'm ready to be your partner. What would you like for me to do? And hopefully that partnership will grow and strengthen and we will be able to achieve many good Senator Bombo Marcos, uh, indeed, it's a bit, a bit of pleasure having you here in Zamboanga. It's an honor to have you, sir. And, uh, 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 the people of Zamboanga really feel that uh, we are blessed with you there in, in the Senate. And we, I'm sure we would be totally blessed if you become Vice President. You're very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, as I said, no limit to the people of Zamboanga. In Calor, the Latin candidate for Vice President Bombo Marcos, the Senator Ronnie Gedotala, muchas gracias. Bye bye.